Welcome to this session of the Living Your Best Life with Kidney Disease virtual forum. Thank you to Atsuka Canada and Paladin Labs for providing unrestricted financial support for this forum. <coughs> Nous remercions Atsuka Canada <coughs> et Laboratoire Paladin d'avoir apporté un soutien financier sans restriction à ce forum. The information presented in this virtual forum is current as of January 25th and 26th, 2022. The material shared in this presentation is not intended to be medical advice. We suggest people speak to their doctor about their own individual situation. This information is intended for a Canadian audience. Les informations présentées dans le forum virtuel sont à jour en date du 25 et 26 janvier 2022. Le matériel partagé dans cette présentation n'est pas destiné à être un avis médical. Nous suggérons aux gens de parler à leur médecin de leur situation personnelle. Cette information est destinée à un public canadien. Today's session is living well on dialysis. I'm glad to see so many of you out today because we have a lot of great speakers and I'm really excited to get into it. But before I do, I just want to take a quick second to acknowledge that I am broadcasting to you today from Toronto, which is in the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And it is also now home to many other diverse First Nations groups, including the Inuit and the Métis peoples. I'd also like to acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, which was signed by the aforementioned Mississauga of the Credit, as well as the Williams Treaties, which were signed with the multiple Mississauga and Chippewa bands. Uh, if you are following at home today and you happen to know anything about the land acknowledgement of where you're from, feel free to put it in the chat. And uh, if you don't know anything about the land acknowledgement you're from, that's fine too. Just let us know where you're from any way you know how, because it's always nice to know where everyone hails from. So, with that, I should probably introduce myself. My name's Joe Gallagher. My kidneys failed for the first time over 15 years ago, and I was officially diagnosed with systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE, for those who haven't heard of it. Uh, I lived with varying stages of kidney disease and end-stage renal disease ever since. My experience has been with in-center hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, both APD and CAPD which is the automated or the manual bags as we call them, and combined those make up my current treatment. I'm a bit, a bit of a couch surfer and I travel a lot in Southern Ontario for work and leisure. I work part-time as a self-employed technical consultant and I'm studying for a degree in the life sciences. And I volunteer as a peer supporter and a group facilitator at the Kidney Foundation, which is what I'm doing here today. And of course, in addition to all that, I'm also a patient just like many of you. So um, in this would normally be the time where I would ask maybe other people to introduce themselves, but we don't have time for that today. So what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna have a very fun poll. So Janice, if I could get you to, to load that up for everyone. Here we go. This is a, it's a really simple question. We just wanna get an idea of where everyone is in their kidney journey. So if you see that pop up on your screen there and you have a second to, to oh, I see yes, everybody is entering their information. That's great. It's, I see some people are changing their opinions. Numbers are switching back and forth. It's all very exciting. And I'll give you maybe 10 more seconds to lock in your answers. So I do see that it's still changing ever so slightly. See where everyone is from and where they are at in their journey. It's great. Perfect. I think we're ready. It looks like I might be able to share these results. Oh, there we go. They are sharing. This is perfect. So it looks like we have a lot of pre-dialysis patients here today, uh, a few dialysis patients doing hemo, the odd peritoneal, a good number of transplant patients, a few care partners, and some others. The others. There's always some others. <laughs> perfect. All right. Well, now that we've got a chance to get to know each other a little better and everyone who's on the call, it's to be a great time to just get right in and, and hear from some of our presenters. Uh, as again, we have a really great lineup for you today. So I'd like to turn it over to Roy Nguyen, who's going to tell us a little bit about his time in MCKC, as well as some of his adventures on peritoneal dialysis. 
Hey, thanks, Joe. I uh, appreciate it. Really happy to be here. I'm actually honored and privileged uh, to be part of this community. Uh, so as Joe said, I'm, uh, my name is Loy. And, um, you know, just a bit about me. I'm 47 years old, married with two boys. They're 10 and 11 years old. I want to share with you a little bit of, of <clears throat> my kidney journey. Uh, and then I'll share how I'm living my best life with kidney disease, as I, I really uh, feel like I am. So uh, in terms of my kidney journey, uh, about five or six years ago, I was diagnosed with polycystic kidney disease uh, from my family doctor. He then referred me to a nephrologist, a local nephrologist, uh, and I was uh, under his care for a little bit. And he was really just watching my uh, kidney function and just keeping a close eye on it. And any uh, symptoms that I had, he was uh, prescribing medication for me. And at that time, I was around 40% kidney function. Uh, the kidney function then uh, declined to a point where I was able to get referred to an MCKC, so multi-care kidney clinic. That's with the Toronto General Hospital. And this was just a, an immersive, incredible experience. I was able to get um, a whole team of medical professionals to help me out. So that included the nephrologist, a nurse, social worker, dietitian, and pharmacist. So whenever I went in for a clinic or an appointment, I got to see all of these individuals. Um, and it was really, really amazing uh, just to have that kind of care. Uh, and they, uh, you know, provided lots of support as, uh, you know, to try to stabilize my kidney function. Unfortunately, uh, my kidney function continued to decline and uh, I had to make a decision to go on either hemo or PD, I decided to go on PD, PD, peritoneal dialysis, and I also decided to do it at home, not at the, uh, the hospital. So that's what I've been doing for the last two years, uh, home PD. So I get hooked up every night uh, and I do my treatments overnight. Uh, and, um, and that's been going really, really well. Um, in parallel to my treatments, I also have been uh, on the, uh, kidney transplant waiting list. And I've actually been called upon to be a backup recipient for a, a kidney uh, a number of times. And uh, so I know my time for a, a new kidney is going to come hopefully very, very soon. So that's a little bit about my kidney journey so far. In terms of living my best life, I want to just share my screen and just share a, a few photos of kind of how I'm really living you know, my best life. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I really love is camping. And when I got diagnosed, uh, um, uh, to, or, or when I uh, started dialysis, I, I didn't know if I would be able to do, uh, go camping. So this is one of the first trips I took with my family. And, you know, invariably everybody wants to know, well, how did you do your treatments? Well, I did them in the car. Uh, so you can see the bag is all hooked up and my wife's in the back there preparing, uh, I think a meal. And um, yeah, and, and it's really, really easy to do the treatments uh, with this modality. And thank heavens, I, I picked this modality. It worked really great for me. Um, and um, this gave me a lot of confidence that I can maybe pursue other types of camping. Because uh, this type of camping uh, is at a provincial park where you just drive into the campsite, you set up your tent, and, uh, and then you, you, you rest and relax. Uh, but uh, moving forward, uh, there was a type of camping that I wanted to pursue, which was canoe camping. So this is where I would park somewhere up north and then canoe uh, one or two hours to a campsite and just have an incredible view, an incredible experience. And this particular trip, I, that's Joe. I, I don't know if you can recognize him there, but that is him. I will validate that. This is my friend, Graham. I reconnected with him. He's a high school friend. And I reconnected with him on Facebook um, because I have a, a dedicated Facebook page where I'm diarizing my kidney journey. And it, the, the Facebook page is called Kidney for a Camper. You can check it out anytime. Uh, and then, you know, obviously, you know, how did I do my treatments here? Obviously, because I don't have a car. Well, I just used a tree. And this is the tree that Joe and I used uh, during the trip where we did our, our treatments. And, uh, you know, it, it was great. Uh, certainly a better view uh, than anything I've experienced in terms of doing my treatments. And, and Joe would probably agree. And you can see the, the weather and everything was just spectacular. It was just an incredible experience. Uh, I wish uh, I could somehow 
uh, bottle this up and, and you know take it home with me. Um, I have to wait till summer uh, to have this experience again. Uh, in terms of hygiene, you know, I get a lot of questions about, well, you know, how do, how do you keep uh, things clean? You know, it's, a, it's like anything else, you, you just wash your hands. In this case, I use camp suds and then I sanitize and then off I go and doing my treatments and uh, perfectly fine. The other question I always, I always get also is in terms of the dialysis bags, they're not heated, obviously. You know, does that bother you? No, the temperature of the dialysis bags does not bother me. So I'm able to do this treatment um, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and really uh, uh, enjoy the whole uh, uh, trip. Other things I do, you know, because I am uh, a busy father and uh, a homeowner, uh, this is me just changing the tires from, uh, I think it's from winter to summer. Uh, so I'm able to do that myself. Also, this is me just, uh, and I took my family out to a Christmas tree farm and we went and uh, uh, picked a Christmas tree and, and, and uh, we cut it down and then we brought it home. And then just recently, um, this is one of my more ambitious uh, uh, things that I've done. Uh, I pulled the carpet and underlay uh, on, uh, in my home and I replaced it with hardwood. Again, you can visit my Facebook page and see kind of what the results are, kidney for a camper. Uh, in Toronto, we had a huge snowfall, Snowmageddon uh, last Monday, and I was able to keep up with all of the snowfall. Uh, I had to take about four trips out and, um, and, and clear the snow off my driveway. And that's me and my family during the Christmas uh, season. Uh, and we, we also have a, a puppy right now. Um, but anyway, so that's uh, a little bit about me. I'm going to just stop sharing. And uh, I'll uh, pass it on to uh, back to you, Joe. Thanks so much. That was great. Thanks for sharing your story, Loy. It's uh, really inspiring. Obviously, the, the camping really, uh, I was so great, grateful to come with you on that trip. And it was a really awesome opportunity. I hadn't never had an opportunity to go that deep in, uh, into the bush or do any canoe camping prior. So being able to push the limits of PD was a, was a really wonderful time. Uh, it's great that you're able to manage your family and everything as well. It's, it's, you're juggling it and you're making it work. That's awesome. I'm uh, gonna turn it over to the next presenter today and that's Amanpreet Kerr. Um, she has some experience with the crash start, which for those of you who don't know means basically finding out you have kidney disease at the very last second and it's an emergency. Uh, you tend to end up in the hospital and she can tell you all about that. In addition, she recently made the decision to switch from in-center dialysis to home hemodialysis. So she's got a lot to share with us. Uh, take it away, Amanpreet. Hello everyone. Uh, so my name is Amanpreet. I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be sharing my experience today. I'm from Brampton, Ontario. I'm 36 years old. So I started going to my family doctor in May 2014. The reason was I was always tired, like I never had any energy. So after running multiple tests, it was found that I have, uh, that my kidney figures were really off. So I was sent urgently to the nephrologist who ordered a biopsy, kidney biopsy, and it was diagnosed that I have IgA nephropathy, which is a kind of autoimmune disorder. And I found out that I just have 30% kidney function left. So the nephrologist disclosed in the first meeting itself that this disorder can neither be reversed nor stopped from progressing. The only treatment they call is to try and delay the process. So it, it came as a shock because I don't have any family history of any kind of kidney disease or disorder and I had no medical complication whatsoever. Even when I came to Canada in 2010, uh, it was a part of the process to clear the medicals, which I did at that time. So between the 2010 and 2014, I, I don't know what happened. They just told me it's IgA nephropathy, which is autoimmune. So as guided by my doctor and my dietitian, I made the lifestyle and dietary changes. So the kidney function was stable for one year, but after one year, it just started dropping drastically. My mother who resides in UK, she came as a kidney donor. Uh, my transplant workup was done here at St. Michael's in Toronto. 
And 80% of, of my mom's tests were done in UK itself. And then she was asked to come and uh, come to Canada. So everything was going fine. But during the last test, we found out that she is borderline diabetic, which means that she could get diabetes in the next five years. Uh, so, so she was turned on as a donor. So on August 10, 2016, it was established that I'm not going to have a transplant and the only option is dialysis. So until then, I, was, I wasn't displaying any symptoms whatsoever, although my creatinine was up to 1100. But between August 11 and August 16, I crashed. And that is what, what in my case I refer to as a crash start because I was fine. But just before the decision was to be made transplant or dialysis, I crashed. Uh, I'm going to explain what exactly happened. So I had a very strange white coating on my tongue. I started experiencing a stomach disorder and then my stomach started bloating. I couldn't understand what has happened to my stomach and it even started increasing in size. Then, then I started bleeding. By bleeding, I mean, I mean um, a vaginal bleeding in my case. And I bled so much in those five days that I ended up going to the ER twice. My blood count and my platelets went uh, dangerously low. My nephrologist tried giving me a steroid to stabilize my platelet count, but my body did not respond to it. I remember I went to the washroom and I passed out. I was in, infused with two units of blood and one unit of platelets uh, just before my surgery was to be performed to put in the A line because my body at that time was very fragile even for that small surgery. Uh, so on August 16, I started my day with passing out in the washroom, following multiple transfusions, later went through with the surgery and then had my first dialysis. So the hospital being exceptionally busy, I spent two days in the ER itself. But the good thing is that within two treatments, I felt much better. The strange coating on my tongue disappeared. disappeared. My body resp responded very quickly and very positive to dialysis treatment. So since, since uh, five years now, I'm in in-center treatment. But at that time, uh, since I was very close to a transplant, I wasn't mentally prepared for dialysis. I felt very defeated and I felt very angry that my body has failed me and now I'm dependent on a machine. So I shared this feeling with my husband, but he said next just changed my perception. So he said when he saw me connecting to the machine, he said, uh, he, said he had a sigh of relief because he know that it's for my betterment and the treatment will take the pressure of toxins off my body. So it's not a defeat. So his words faded away my anger. And since till today, I try to remind myself to be grateful for the right treatment. And recently, me and my husband have been trained for home hemo. Uh, the training usually takes a six to eight weeks, and we were done in six weeks. So there is just some delay with the installation of the machine at home. And I'm really looking forward. I'm very excited for a new lifestyle change when it starts. So, so that's my journey. Thank you. Wow, what a story. Thank you so much for sharing. That's a uh, very powerful stuff. Um, yeah, the, the fluid buildup, the edema that a lot of us experience when we aren't prepared for dialysis and let those of the uh, fluids build up can be a really, really awful experience. And, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful that you were able to share that with us and that you made it through and that you look great today. So thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Mike McCormick. Uh, Mike is a longtime hemo patient. He's lived a very, very active life, done many activities, and, and has worked. Um, he's also just absolutely crushing dialysis, I would say. And I'm really looking forward to hearing his story because he just never lets kidney disease get in his way. Go ahead, Mike. All right. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, everyone, for allowing me to share my story with you today. Uh, some of my more recent challenges are very fresh and have been particularly difficult. So I ask you, uh, I ask your understanding if I need a few seconds to gather myself along the way here. Uh, this is a story about the many ups and downs that most people on a kidney journey experience. This is about celebrating the accomplishments, but always preparing for that next challenge that will inevitably come our way and the need to focus as much on mental health and mental preparedness as it is about dealing with the physical, medical aspects of kidney disease. 
they don't call us kidney warriors for nothing. My kidney journey began almost 35 years ago when I was in my final year of high school, living a young and carefree lifestyle of many 18 year olds. I woke up one Sunday morning with my eyes swollen shut and my breathing heavy. There was clearly something wrong, but my family and I had no idea what it was. A quick trip to the local emergency room, some blood work and urinalysis results later, and I was told I was in complete kidney failure. I was transferred from my local town hospital to the big city hospital of St. Michael's in downtown Toronto for further kidney treatment. That first year had so many ups and downs, mainly downs, but they came at me so fast and so often, I never really had an opportunity to take stock of my life or really to sit down and worry. To be honest, most of the time, I was just happy to be alive. That first year ended with an attempt at a living related transplant from my father. Transplants with my specific type of kidney disease, acute FSGS, were known to have a high likelihood of recurrent disease failure, meaning the disease was circulating in my body and would likely attack the new kidney in the same way as happened to my own kidneys. My medical team told me this, but all I could think about was no more dialysis. When I learned the FSGS had gone into the new kidney while I was still on the OR table, I was devastated. Like many kidney patients who end up on dialysis, I thought dialysis was something that only had to be tolerated until I got my new lease on life. I had not prepared for this outcome. Not only did the transplant not work, but I was back on dialysis even faster than my next scheduled treatment. Fast forward six years, now finished high school and in, in the midst of my third year of university, some advances had been made in transplantation with FSGS. So a second transplant was attempted, this time from one of my cousins. However, it had the exact same outcome. A big difference this second time though, mentally, emotionally, I was prepared. I went into the second surgery almost expecting it not to work. And when it didn't, I was much better prepared to deal with the loss, allowing me to move forward with my life. This taught me probably the single most important lesson for living with kidney disease when it comes to managing the ups and downs and my mental health. Celebrate the highs, but prepare for the inevitable lows. With the second transplant failure behind me, my medical team indicated that there was no such, there was no point in planning for any further transplants without significant advancements in research, something that still has not happened to this day. Life would go on, but without the prospect of that new lease on life. With the encouragement of some very progressive thinking doctors and nurses, I was coached to take control of as much of my medical care as I could, which meant learning to operate the machine, learning to put my needles in and take them out, and generally taking complete responsibility for my diet, including fluid control and medications, all with an eye towards home hemodialysis. I met my wife, Heather, while I was in university in Calgary, and we graduated and ultimately settled down back here in Toronto to begin our careers. We immediately focused on purchasing our first home so that I could begin home dialysis and achieve the independence and control that I had been coached for. As Joe mentioned in my introduction, Heather and I have been able to lead productive, fun lives, including lots of travel, a topic that I could easily speak about for hours, athletic endeavors, including a handful of provincial level curling events, and of course, the inevitable bumps in the road that for me were mainly to do with my dialysis accesses, such as fistulas, grafts, and central lines like I have now. Again, using those early lessons allowed me to navigate the challenges, even when a clotted access would cause a trip to be delayed or canceled, or a curling bond spiel to be missed. Easily my biggest challenges with my health, at least since that first year have come in the last three or four years. My string of bad luck began with the failure of my last possible fistula or graft, which meant that I'm now reliant on a central line to complete my dialysis treatments. And I was advised by the surgeon that put the line in that it is likely the last line that he will be able to put in me. 
I've been told that dialysis for 35 straight years causes a lot of damage to the veins and arteries, and that has now put me in a position of my last access. The next and most recent issue is the amputation of both my legs below the knee. The right side in July 2020 and the left side in March 2021. I spent almost 14 consecutive months in hospital, all of it during COVID, which meant most of that time was spent with little or no family or friend support. There was no preparing for this. No amount of positive thinking could steer me away from the negative thoughts about my quality of life or even my demise. And especially the impact this would have on my wife, Heather, and the rest of my family and close friends. I'd love to tell you that I have the answer of how to work through this, but I can't. Not yet, anyway. I'm working with a counselor to understand my situation and to try and reinvent myself as someone that is not defined by physical activity and helping others, but rather someone who needs help with some of the most basic of daily activities. I do know my brain still works and I still have my sense of humor. I have a strong support network of friends, family and professionals, some of whom have been looking after me for almost all of my years on dialysis. I am back working full time, which gives me purpose each day. And slowly I'm working out what this version of me will look like for however much time I have left. I do know that I will get there preparing for the setbacks, but enjoying the victories, even if they are smaller or harder to come by. I certainly do not recommend a lifetime of dialysis, but if that is your journey, I want you to know that you can still have a long and productive life. Thank you for your time today. I hope you found my story insightful. I wish each and every one of you who are on their kidney journey the very best. Thank you. Mike, that was just a gripping story. I've, you've been through so much. It's amazing that you've just come through all of this and done all these things and you're still right back at work and just looking to reinvent and rebuild. It's it, your strength of character is just unmatchable. It's it's amazing. Best of luck and I hope it does go better. Keep getting better for you from here. With that, I have to turn it over to the next participant who is a caregiver. Um, his name is David Lillian. He's been supporting his wife, Bonnie, for two years, who does PD dialysis. And he also has a lot to tell us about what it means to provide support from as, as a spouse and be on the other side of this whole equation. Go ahead, David. Thanks, Joe. And uh, while I'm blown away by what I've heard so far already today uh, in these two sessions, uh, but I, I was brought on to provide a bit of the uh, caregiver perspective on, uh, on going through the kidney journey. Uh, my wife, Bonnie, has, been, uh, has had uh, chronic kidney disease for about 10 years, and only in the last two years she needed to start dialysis, uh, and uh, she opted to go for PD using uh, the uh, Fresenius and the Night Cycler. It's been a positive experience with uh, with a good outcome, um, and largely due to the uh, great uh, team of people at uh, Toronto General, and through the support of the Kidney Foundation. But um, her condition is stabilized, and we've we successfully incorporated dialysis into our lives, which is what you have to do. I'm her sole caregiver, which uh, makes sense since I'm her. Uh, her partner, life partner. And uh, it's a role that takes some getting used to. Um, once you learn though, what, what's, what, what you need to do and the best way to do it, you can get very comfortable with the role. I thought I would jot down a few points about what it takes to be a caregiver, to give you the perspective of, of, of this side of the, uh, the, the coin. Um, and I've come up with five basic needs, I think, uh, for caregivers. The first, of course, is a high level of involvement. You know, you have to, uh, kidney, kidney disease is something that you're going through together uh, with you and uh, your loved one, um, whoever that might be, son, uh, 
parent, daughter, wife, husband. Um, it's important to be aware of, um, of, about the importance. You have to be, you have to be made aware uh, of, of the various components of, of what the, you know, kidney disease is, how to deal with it, the various modalities, diet, medications. It, it, um, it, it's something that you get uh, through training and visits uh, uh, with the clinicians, uh, uh, reading a lot, going on the internet, uh, peer support groups, and, and, and so on. You have to be informed. And, and, and that's a key part of the involvement. Uh, another area I think is important is communication. Uh, you have to be aware of, of what your loved one's needs are. Um, it sounds sometimes easier than it really is. Uh, you have to know what they're feeling, what you can do to help them. And most importantly, you have to be able to assess their, their emotional state. Uh, as it's been mentioned, it's definitely a road uh, that it has bumps. There are highs and there are lows. And you have to be able to assess what those changing needs are. Uh, listening is important, very, very important. And observation is also important because sometimes um, she doesn't want to tell me. She doesn't want to worry me. She, 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 she um, is trying to protect me almost from, and, and uh, I, I uh, resist that because I feel the more I, I'm, I'm tuned into what she's going through, the better a caregiver I can be. Um, another one is adaptability. As we were saying, there's a lot of change uh, um, involved and, you know, change is the one constant that you can be sure of in the kidney journey. Um, so you have to be able to change as a caregiver as the circumstances and needs change. Your role is to help your, your uh, patient, your loved one, adjust to the changes. Um, and 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 that's uh, you know that's important knowing that you're there and that you're supporting them. It's important for them to know that there's a backup for them. Um, they need to feel that they're not alone. Another is a positive attitude. You know, as a caregiver, you have to stay positive, um, you, particularly when the challenges arise, because you know when your loved one needs needs some encouragement, you've got to be the cheerleader. You've got to be the one to give them the energy, the strength, and the positive outlook when sometimes there's this flagging. Um, now as a caregiver, you also have to look after yourself. Um, and, and you have to consider your needs. So like it helps to have uh, outlets like uh, physical activity, uh, pastimes, social activities, outside interests. Uh, you have to be able to maintain your balance because if, if you're not, something not right with you, it will definitely affect your ability as a caregiver. It's good to have people to talk to. That's another thing. Um, and I guess that's true for all of us. Um, but from the caregiver perspective, sometimes it's hard for others who aren't in that role to really appreciate or understand what, what, what we're doing and what we're going through. Um, uh, I participate in a, a peer support group through the Kidney Foundation, specifically for caregivers. And uh, in our monthly meetings, inevitably, we all walk away with something that we've learned, a new perspective, a new appreciation because you get the whole range of, of, of situations uh, for of, of, of where everyone is in the in the kidney journey and how they how are they dealing with it and how we as caregivers can best perform to, to satisfy our role. That's basically all I, I really wanted to impart. Um, 
I do encourage people who are in the caregiver role to, um, to, to join the, the peer support group, because I assure you, you will get uh, a, great, a, a great benefit out of doing so. That's fantastic. Yeah, the, uh, I also would love to second the peer support. It's, it's been a wonderful support for me, and I know probably for some of the other speakers here today as well. It's uh, hard to beat making friends with fellow patients. David, that was a, a really excellent rundown on what it's like to, to be in this supportive spouse role. It's a, it really is a disease that is affects both the couples, you know, and the restrictions, uh, the diet restrictions really tend to apply to both uh, the time, you know, on dialysis, the, the restrictions to travel. It's a lot to be a caregiver. And uh, as David said, you know, you've got to make that time for yourself. And those are a wonderful set of five rules to live by. Uh, you know, that's, that's, thank you very much for sharing your experience because it's a rare experience and one we can learn from. Thank you. I will now have to pass things over to our final, final panelist uh, of the session. Her name is Tracy Zeiler. She is an RN, our registered nurse, of course. And uh, she's also a dedicated volunteer here at the Kidney Foundation. Uh, we're very much looking forward to hearing from her and her experience helping kidney patients, especially new kidney patients, get set up with their treatments. So go ahead, Tracy. Is she? Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Joe, for that. I appreciate that. Um, I truly appreciate the courage and strength of all of our panelists to be able to share your stories today. It's really inspiring for, for me personally, and I think for everybody. So as Joe mentioned, I am a registered nurse within the kidney clinic in Calgary, and my entire role is to provide the treatment option education to people starting their, their dialysis quest or journey. So I have been very fortunate to work with people in various aspects of their kidney journey from working on the inpatient units dialysis units to the hemo and peritoneal dialysis units, as well as I, I worked in emergency and worked with a lot of kidney patients that are, are in a crisis mode at that point. So that's all been very helpful for my journey to be able to provide education to patients as they're thinking about their different treatment options. So kidney disease is definitely a very difficult journey for you guys. So for me, being able to provide information on the different treat, treatment options is really important to me. And I take great pride in being able to help people hopefully determine their, you know, the, the dialysis option that will work for them. And as our panel has, has highlighted so eloquently, there are, are different ways that dialysis can be done. So it is very beneficial to know about the different, different options and to find one that's going to give you guys the best quality of life. Um, I had a gentleman tell me one time that he made dialysis fit his life rather than him fitting dialysis. And he did continue to live his best life on dialysis. So I think that's the important piece is finding that treatment option that is going to give you the best quality of life. Nobody wants to start dialysis. So you want to find that option that's going to help you um, fit it into your life where you're at and, and um, continue to do those things that are important with to you. So when you start with the kidney clinic or on one of the dialysis options, as Loy had mentioned, you aren't alone. You always have that team behind you of the doctors, the nurses, the dietitians, social workers. The whole team is there to support you as you transition through this world of, of the unknown and of dialysis. Um, so again, I appreciate being here with you guys. You guys are all very inspiring to me as a healthcare provider. So thank you. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, that's excellent. It's it's really great to have you here as a healthcare provider, actually, because now is the time when we get to open the floor to questions uh, to all of you, the attendees here today who are listening. So I'll just remind you and direct your attention to the Q and A button uh, down at the bottom there, and uh, you can click on that button and submit your questions there. We do have a couple of questions already uh, that we can jump into and sort of send towards the panelists here. But just before we do that, I just want to make a quick statement and just remind everyone about uh, the medical advice and, and rather that this is, we aren't able to give medical advice here today. Um, we, so 
just keep in mind that uh, anything you hear today, it's sort of our own personal stories of things that happened to us or that worked for us. But uh, anything you hear, just please, please, please take it back to your healthcare team and make sure you're checking with them before you're making any changes to your personal healthcare plan. Um, what works for one patient may not work for another. So we always got to make sure that uh, you're checking in with your doctors and your nurses and your pharmacists and making sure you're getting what's right for you. Okay, so with that, we have a few questions. Also, everyone, please feel free to submit more questions if you have them. Um, the first question, I believe this one was directed at Loy. It came in very early, Loy, when you were showing your pictures um, of the peritoneal dialysis on the tree. And he asks, how come no mask for CAPD? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, I never needed to use a mask. Uh, I, I was trained without one, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, everyone uh, will do their dialysis treatments sort of a little bit different. And for me, uh, having a mask uh, wasn't uh, needed. I know some people use uh, gloves uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I don't use them as well. Um, so, yeah, so it's just more of a personal preference from, from my perspective. Fair enough. I know, uh, in my case, when I was trained, I, I was using masks and, and such like that. And I think that a lot of clinics will definitely recommend them. So, um, you know, it is a... Certainly, I will admit that there have been times where I didn't have a mask candy and, you know, try to do something, some crazy thing like this. But uh, yeah, for sure, it's, it's, I guess, as you said, a personal choice for some patients. Um, the next question is sort of directed at anyone with hemodialysis experience, which I know a few of you do have. Uh, it's any tips or suggestions for those first starting out in hemodialysis? So uh, you guys can just unmute and jump in. I feel like from a healthcare provider's perspective that definitely um, utilizing the peer support is, is beneficial to talking to people um, as you're starting that dialysis journey. Because there's so many technical aspects of it. So if you can talk to somebody that's, that's been through it, that's very helpful. Um, I guess uh, if I could offer one tip, and uh, Tracy made a reference to it as well, is uh, to, to be involved with your care uh, to whatever level you're uh, comfortable with. Uh, in my case, I wanted to know everything. I wanted to do everything uh, because, uh, as Tracy said, I wanted to fit dialysis into my life, not let it uh, control me. So um, ask questions, be respectful, but ask questions. Uh, do your research. Uh, and by research, I mean, don't, uh, don't read blogs necessarily on, on the internet. Uh, uh, use informed sources. Uh, ask people, talk to, to other patients or uh, like the, the waiting room's a great place to, uh, to strike up a conversation. You maybe see someone, uh, doing something that, uh, you're like, okay, how did you figure that out? Uh, really it's, uh, you know, there's no, there's no grand manual <laughs> that, that we all have a copy of. Uh, you just figure it out as you go and, uh, you know, uh, Make it work for you. Don't uh, don't just sit back and be passive. Uh, take control. Uh, that's a really excellent advice. Actually, to to advocate for yourself as a patient is definitely, you know, definitely helps a lot. Um, having that knowledge and making sure that you don't slip through the cracks is, a, so to speak, is a, is a, is definitely very 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 good. Um, Amon I wonder if I could direct this question at you just really quickly, because you had a crash start experience there. And I wonder, um, back in those days, if you could have done it differently, um, is there anything you might have done differently uh, heading into HEMO so it didn't end up as such an emergency situation? Sure, that's a good question. But in uh, my case was a bit different because I wasn't waiting uh, for dialysis. 
I wasn't delaying the process intentionally. My delay happened because I was waiting for transplant and even my doctor was very hopeful that I might just start with transplant. I might just go for transplant and I might never even end up on dialysis. So that was my reason of the delay. I wasn't delaying it intentionally, but if that, that was the scenario, I, I would always have trusted my doctor. And not because only he's my doctor, because he has seen all kinds of patient. He has a lot of experience. The medical team knows what's coming ahead as a patient, as somebody who is approaching dialysis. I, I was very naive and I was very scared. I was even hoping for miracles that at the last moment, I'm going to get well and this is not going to happen. I'm not going to for dialysis. My body is just going to recover. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I, my piece of advice would be just have a heart to heart talk with your doctor because they know it all. And we, we as patient, we rely on hopes and miracles sometimes, but they can, they can guide you what will be the best decision for your body. It's a good answer. Yeah, that's right. I, I'm, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that the transplant didn't work out. I am uh, gonna turn that to the next question now, but that was really great. And I, I like what you said there about uh, the hoping for the miracles. I think we've all done a little bit of that. And I, I saw many of the panelists smile uh, when you said that. So I think we've all been there. Um, the next question is directed at you, Mike. What is the most rewarding aspect of being involved with uh, CanSolve CKD network? Uh, well, you, you got his name uh, bang on. So congratulations on that. Uh, nice to see a familiar uh, name and face, Robert. Um, so for those of you that don't know, uh, CanSolve CKD is a, uh, a national research network that was started up back in 2014. Uh, there's a few people that are involved in it uh, on this call. Kate Chong and I uh, were uh, the two of the three initial uh, patient co-chairs. So essentially what it is, is a uh, we received uh, uh, some funding uh, dollars and um, we put together a, a group that included patients, researchers, clinicians, uh, kidney foundation reps, because obviously the kidney foundation was a big uh, funder of this project uh, or series of projects. And we ultimately uh, funded uh, 27 research projects that are all patient focused. Uh, so patients were involved in prioritizing uh, what was being researched and we are involved in everything from study design to uh, um, contributing to uh, like how to get patients involved and we're slowly building out this network so that researchers have a group of patients to, uh, uh, to, uh, to draw from for their projects. Um, so to Robert's question, what was the most, uh, I forgot what the word was, but the most inspiring thing. Um, I think just being able to bring uh, to bring people from all walks of life, uh, kidney disease it does not uh, does not really care uh, about your race or your culture or your age or your gender. Uh, it uh, it doesn't uh, doesn't discriminate. It, it can get anyone. Um, and Robert, I guess more specifically, and I'm, I'm thinking about this as I go here. Uh, one aspect to um, to the cancel CKD network is that we have quite a large uh, First Nations um, uh, patient group involved in the project to, as well. And for those that don't know, Indigenous people are quite disproportionately affected by uh, kidney disease. So we've been able to focus a lot of health care uh, towards Indigenous groups with uh, with their input with them and and for them so it's uh to me that part i really did not know much about uh what it was like to live outside of a big city so uh trying to understand the uh the health needs of people that live 
like where you have to fly to see your nurse or doctor, it was really eye opening. And I think uh, that's probably the single uh, uh, most important thing that uh, CanSolve was able to achieve. And if I'm allowed to put a plug in, if anyone's interested in CanSolve CKD, uh, look us up. We have a, a great website, summaries for all the projects, and we're always looking for more patients to get involved. All right. Yeah, that sounds like a great program. Uh, and flying communities definitely are very underserved. So I'm happy to hear that someone out there is helping those groups. Um, and it, you know, it's it's really great to have lots of groups out there doing various different things and providing peer support. Um, you know, uh, I would hope that uh, maybe for some of those groups as well, you might let them know that the Kidney Foundation has online peer support groups uh, as well. That uh, is, that might be very helpful for some of these remote communities that might still have access to the internet. That's to still find a community of people There's that they can reach out to and uh, you know connect with other patients. Um, I imagine that'd be very hard to do in a remote community. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Robert, for the question. I'm turning it over to the next question. What about the need to change how you do dialysis? How do you cope with changes in your care? Does anybody want to tackle that one? Take a second. any ideas about changing. I'm actually in the hospital right now and uh, they're putting a little pressure on me to change to, to hemodialysis from PD because they're not convinced that I'm getting quite enough. Um, we've had a few few challenges and um, for me, I guess I just cope the way I always would cope, which is if it has to be done, it has to be done and I, I just do it. Um, you know, I want to be healthy and like Amanpreet said, if the doctors are convinced that there's no better way than there's probably no better way. I hope that answered the question. The next question, are you allowed to be a part of a peer group without having been referred to a kidney clinic yet? Um, I think I can just quickly answer that one for you. Absolutely. When it comes to the Kidney Foundation, all of our peer groups are open to anybody, any patients. So uh, we actually have some that are for pre-dialysis patients. So if you've got your diagnosis, but you're not very far along in the journey, there's a group actually specifically for you, and you can find that on the Kidney Foundation webpage. Um, what is the time here? I should just double check. Probably got a little time left. Uh, uh, this one is, I teach treatment modality to CKD patients heading towards dialysis. How can we help those CKD patients who are in denial and crashing into starting HD via central venous catheter because they are hoping to bypass dialysis? That's a tough question as well. Um, I think just continuing to provide the education and the support and just reiterating all of the different options, kind of each visit. Um, I mean, unfortunately, denial is a big part of this journey. And, and, it, and just in the fact that a person, of course, like you said, Amanpreet, you just hoping for that miracle, right? So I think just continuing to educate and review the options and finding out what their, um, what their barriers are. What's, what's the barriers to that person possibly, um, you know, not uh, moving forward with maybe thinking about the options as opposed to just ignoring them. I think that's all I could offer. Just continuous education, continuous support um, and sometimes like those barrier or those people are maybe in denial because of a certain barrier that's come up or a belief system or something. So maybe getting to the root of those things as well. I don't know if that answered the question properly or not. If, if I could share my experience, what, what helped me at that time. Uh, so uh, my, my so I was very scared. I was 30 at the time. So my social worker asked me if I wanted to see another fellow patient. So I said, yes. So uh, it is it helps to talk to people about it, but it 
really helps if you talk to the right people about it. So she connected me to the patient who was exactly my age. She was 30. So I went and saw her while she was on her treatment. I, I asked her all kinds of questions, starting how to take care of my line. How about my personal hygiene? How do I do my clothing after? How do I wash my hair? Can, I, can you do your hand like that if you have a line? She, 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 and she was the right person to talk to. She was very comfortable with her body. Um, she was very confident. She was very profound. And that really helped me at that time. Um, maybe if uh, there was another person who has got kids, you know, a lady who has got kids, how do you take care of the kids? In that case, they would have connected her to that right person. But uh, she, the my social worker connected me accordingly. So uh, with my experience, I would say talk to the right people. And your hospital staff knows whom to connect you to. Thank you. That's great advice. Yeah. I, I would also like to add that, uh, again, you can contact the Kidney Foundation, and they do have a one-on-one -on -one peer support uh, uh, capability so that they can also tie, connect you with somebody who's, who's very similar to your situation who might uh, be able to provide the exact kinds of uh, answers to the questions that uh, Amanpreet was talking about real practical advice. Absolutely, it's a, it's a wonderful program and many, a few of other panelists here actually participate in that program. So you might even get a chance to meet some of them. <laughs> Everyone with that, it's uh, getting to be, it's 3.58 now, so we're pretty much at the end of our time. So I have to uh, conclude the session. I know we have a few questions left, but that's okay. If you just bear with me for a second, I do have a way for you to still get those questions answered. But I just wanna take a second to thank everyone for being here today. It's a, it was a really great session. I learned a lot. I hope that you all learned a lot. Um, to our panelists, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, thank you, Loy, Amanpreet, Mike, David, Tracy, all of you. you. You gave us some amazing stories and some very inspiration or, and a lot of inspiration basically to, to help us improve the way we live our own lives on dialysis. And for those of you who are heading towards it, you know, please uh, take home these stories and, and, and know that you can live great lives just like our panelists here. So thank you again so much for coming.